will. If you didn't hear, Linda's mom passed away this morning. Last week, I visited a woman in the hospital, I told you about it, who was doing fine on, on Christmas, New Year's Day. She was at work, ended up in the hospital, and she's in bad shape. This week, uh, I visited, and then Dad visited, the dad of one of my best friends growing up. He was kind of like a dad, spent a lot of time with him. He was in the hospital. Boy, I hate that. I really do. I'm not one of these people that, oh, death is part of nature. It's part of, oh, let's feel it. No, no, no. I hate the separation. Over, over the holidays, I was thinking about all the people I love who are no longer with us. And uh, I take a lot of comfort, those that are believers, knowing where, that, where they are, knowing that they, they're rejoicing. But I, I don't buy into this crap about cycling your atoms through nature. Who cares what daisies pop up over your grave? I, you're not going to care. Uh, I don't make friends with death. I hate it, and that's one of the reasons why I want to everybody to know that God is real and God loves you, and you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be eternally separated from him. You can be uh, with God and with God's people in heaven forever. Please open up your hearts. Please do not delay. Please make that decision. Accept the forgiveness that's offered to you. Accept the love that's offered to you. Linda's mom, I don't know her as well as some in this church, but I've had the pleasure to talk with her. I've had the pleasure of praying with her, uh, to study scripture with her. She is a sweet and godly woman. She and her husband were missionaries to Samoa. Missionaries to Samoa, leaving, going overseas to tell people that there is a God, that there's a God in heaven, and he loves you, and he wants you to be with him. He wants to forgive all of your sins and bring you into his presence. Uh, massive heart attack. Suddenly, system shutting down, and now this morning she passed. I want us to keep in mind the brevity of life today as we study the Word this morning. And we're going to be taking communion. Uh, we're going to be taking communion during the middle of the service. So please turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, 1 through 26. <clears throat> now the Passover, Passover and the festival of unleavened bread only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table of the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And Christ is not only prophesying his death to come shortly, he's also prophesying that this message, which is confined to a small region around uh, Jerusalem and in Judea, will one day go out to the farthest corners of the world. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, 
went to the chief priests. One of the 12, one of his inner core, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city, this is Jerusalem, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant. This is the contract, the promise. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Singing hymns together is part of our belief in God, our worship of God, right here uh, from the Old Testament, right here through the New Testament, Christ himself did it. <coughs> when we sing praises to God, we don't do that for ourselves, do we? The music is not for us. The music is to praise God in heaven. But today, when we were singing, I kind of felt like we were singing for Linda. And... Uh, together reaffirming these beautiful truths that we have. It's important that we do things together as a church. Brothers and sisters, communion, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, it's open to anybody who's put their faith in Jesus Christ. If you've come to a point in your life where you're saying, I'm not going to trust in myself anymore. I know I'm a sinner. I know I've messed up in so many ways. And I'm not going to make an excuse for it. I'm not going to defend it. I don't want to try and explain it away. I just want to come clean and say, God, I know. I know, Lord, that I fall so far short of your holy standards. And if you said, to God, Lord God, please forgive. I want to I want to be part of your family. I want to be your people. Forgive my sins. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me on the cross. Then we are one family, brothers and sisters for eternity. And I want to welcome you. Take communion today. It's a symbol of our unity. We're in communion with God because of, and with each other because of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. Communion is for those who have surrendered their wills, who have given themselves to God. If that's you, if that describes you this morning, dear brother, dear sister, let's eat together as a family should. Thank you. Dear Savior, don't miss the plot. Right before the cross, don't miss the plot. Chapter 14 from verse 27. This is what Jesus says. You will all fall away. He's talking to his dear disciples. They had Passover together. They had communion together. 
Now he says, they've sung together, and he says, you're going to all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Listen to the way this man talks. Absolute certainty that he will rise again. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if everyone falls away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to the disciples, sit here while I pray. He took J Peter and James and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and he prayed, if it is possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, Are you asleep? Could you not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Let's try to stay awake at church. It's just a little... Let's inject that. They did not know what to say to him. Yep. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is div being delivered in the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go meet them. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, the one I kiss is the man, arrest him, and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then someone stood and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? This is the testimony that these men are bringing against you. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah? The son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witness? You have heard this blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls, one of the high priests, came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You, were, you also were with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went away into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. 
Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore at them, I don't know this man. I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster, crow, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down, and he wept bitterly. If you've heard that story too many times, if you're too familiar with it, I want you to know something. That story is unique in all religions in so many ways. I often think about this as I read my Bible. I think that Jesus and his handful of followers sat around a table 20 centuries ago. He was betrayed with a kiss by one of his closest confidants. He was mocked and beaten condemned falsely about 20 centuries ago, and that changed the world. There's no precedent for this. There's nothing else like it in, in actual history or in mythology, in mythology ever. Today, millions upon millions of people from every nation on our earth are at church. Untold millions of people love Jesus. Untold millions of people said, Lord, forgive my sin and found forgiveness from every people group on the planet, filled with love and gratitude because of the one who came to die for their sins and rise again to bring them the hope of eternal life. And somehow this message, again written by mostly shepherds in the Old Testament, mostly fishermen in the New Testament, has found its way into every culture, in every generation, from the halls of Princeton, Oxford, Harvard, to the jungles of Samoa, to the jungles of Papua New Guinea, to the jungles of India, South America, Africa, everywhere. Every religion on earth can only be imagined, try this, in the context of the culture of its birthplace. You cannot think about Islam apart from Arabic. In, in Arabia. You can't think of, uh, you can't think of uh, Buddhism apart from India and China. You can't think about Hinduism outside of India. It's Indian to its core. But no one language, no one culture, there's no nation on earth that claims, it can claim it owns Christianity. Today, there are churches all over the world, they're singing praises to God in their own languages, according to their own cultural customs, because of what we are reading here in Scripture, this rocked the world. And you're being disingenuous if you don't recognize this is a completely different scale. This is completely different than any other religious story out there. Korean churches filled with prayer, prayer meetings that go hours long, prayer meetings that shake the roof off of the church. Spanish-speaking churches, seeing such beautiful Spanish, Hispanic music in so many different countries all over the world. A while back, we saw a picture here, we saw a video here of the rapid growth of Christianity in China. Today, it's very possible there are more true believers in Jesus Christ in China than in the United States, and is growing rapidly. So, get used to Asian people. You're going to be with us for a long time. Before that, we saw a video of jungle tribesmen. And remember, I had to give a caveat. The dudes aren't wearing much in the way of clothing. And we saw the missionary plane landing. They had been Christians for some time, but there were a few Bibles that had finally been translated into their language. And remember the celebration as they lined the... The, the airstrip and the weeping as they received their Bibles for the first time. And we say we don't have time to read this Bible? It's almost like our abundance of blessings is a curse. Today, I want to talk about, you've heard me talk about this country before, this state. It's a state in India, northeast India, called Nagaland. The reason I brought it up again and again is it's one of the great miracles of modern Christianity, along with Korea. 
which, which rapidly, before World War II, Christianity was a small percent. To today, it's about half the country are Christians, uh, along with China, which they kicked out the missionaries, and Christianity just boom and exploded underneath the fist of, of, of communist persecution. What has happened in Nagaland is another miracle of Jesus Christ. You, if you don't want to believe this book, if you don't want to believe Jesus is the Son of God, you're, you're stuck with a difficult position. Either you have to admit this is a miracle of God or this is an amazing secular miracle. There's nothing like it that has ever existed that is changing and transforming lives around the world. And Nagaland is another example, an amazing true story of the power of the gospel, the authority of the scriptures to change and utterly transform a culture. This is a beautiful story. Please listen. The Romans were shocked when they invaded Britain and found it had HUD hunters. Even pagan Romans thought, well, this is shocking. It was the same when the British invaded Northeast India centuries later. In fact, the Naga warriors were so fierce, the British Empire never fully defeated them. Uh, up until recent times, there were patches of India that were unmapped because nobody could go there. <clears throat> the Naga uh, were the guys, and I can't even remember the, the name, the sharpened sticks at the bottom of pits. We know that we have a name for that. That came from the Naga language. <laughs> Uh, they were extraordinarily dangerous, and they were always at war with one another. They were surrounded by uh, large rivers, by mountains. You didn't want to go there because they would take your head, and they would take your head as a talisman because they thought that the skull contained your soul. They thought if the more souls you collect, the better. That would be a blessing to them and their village, and they regularly raided one another's villages. I think there's 32 different languages in, in Nagaland. And they were, uh, they would, if you were an old man out walking, happy to take your head. Kids out playing, happy to take your head. Pregnant woman, happy to take your head. Very, very dangerous and brutal land. Uh, Naga tribesmen would collect these skulls of humans also, but also am animals ambushing one another. And I saw fairly recent videos, several of them on FaceTube, on YouTube, FaceTube, <laughs> Facebook and YouTube, on YouTube. And they were old men. They still got the tattoos covering their whole body and faces uh, because the men liked to style in that culture. They spent a lot of time on elaborate headdresses. By the way, the people look Japanese. They're an Oriental people living in India. They look Japanese, but they, their traditions, their headdresses and everything look, I don't know what it looks like. It looks a little more like Papua New Guinea than India. But they were, they, they were very, and so they, there's guys still out there interviewing one guy who said he was involved in 16 successful ambushes. He's an old toothless guy with tattoos and his wrinkled skin everywhere. The culture was also very sexually permissive. And it was unfair to women. The women were forced to do most of the hard labor. And the men had the excuse of having to carry their weapons because people could invade any time. But also, they liked to spend a lot of time dressing up and primping. The men were, were the fashion plates of the culture. The Nagas were also very cautious, fearing outsiders, very superstitious, involving a lot of ritual. It wasn't until the mid-1930s that uh, there were some people who came in earlier. Then there was a long gap where people couldn't get in there. Then in the 1930s, a Westerner, a man from Austria named Christoph von Fuhrer Heimendorf, was allowed into Nagaland. He had a, a Nazi passport, so the British took him and threw him in a jail for a while, but they liked him so much they let him go back and do his work. He took a lot of pictures and films and studied the Naga languages and cultures. He was an anthropologist, and he was able to return in the 1960s to check on the Nagas, this culture that was so sexually permissive, so dark and, and superstitious, so violent, uh, so unfair to women. He came back in the 1960s, and he was disappointed. And he lamented, and I watched his video that he made in in the 1970, called Those Who Hunted Heads. Uh, he lamented that in just one generation, here's his quote, an admirable way of life had been lost because the Nagas accepted Christianity. And he was bitter and disappointed that these headhunters were no longer hunting heads, that the women were dressing in clothes and not running around, 
It reminded me of a TV show that Dad and I saw years ago because this is, a, this is a common lament among people who don't love Jesus. Oh, look what you're doing to that culture. Uh, reminded me of a TV show I saw years ago. I think this was Papua New Guinea. It was a, a, a jungle, uh, a, a, an island nation. And uh, there was an anthropologist who was going through there, and he said, I may be among the first white men to go through here. And he was naming a waterfall, you know, the arrogance. He goes in there, and he's going to name things. And he, he came across a tribe, and he talked to this tribe. And as he was talking, I thought, wow, they kind of look the same. You know, this anthropologist from England and this jungle tribesman, they both had a, a grin on their faces. And, and the tribesman said, yeah. The people who used to be headhunters, this is not in India, this is a different group of headhunters. He said, now they've got a Western religion, they're Christians, and, and, and they're not hunting their heads anymore, and they're going to all the villages telling people about Jesus. And they came to us, and, and we tricked them, and we said we believed in Jesus, but we didn't. And, he went, <laughs> and the anthropologist went, <laughs> and two nasty guys were looking at each other because they pulled it over, all over the wool. They missed the plot, didn't they? In a wicked culture that had had centuries of this cycle of violence, and we're going to cut off your heads, and we're going to cut off your heads, found the living God, and it transformed them. And no white people were running around. These were, these were the people of that tribe going to other tribes just to tell them about Jesus. We don't want to cut off your heads anymore. There's a God that's real, and he loves you. And this anthropologist and this other tribe were going, hey, we tricked them. They missed the plot. I'll tell you what. When a culture finds Jesus Christ, and I've seen this in Korea and in other places, when a culture finds Jesus Christ, you don't lose your culture. Your culture expresses itself in the most beautiful way it possibly could. And there's nothing more beautiful than hearing uh, people from different tribes, different nationalities, singing to God praises in their own language, wearing their own cultural clothing, wearing, singing their, with their own language, reading Bibles in their own language. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. They missed the plot. And this, going back to Nagaland, about this anthropologist, this Fuhrer Heimendorf guy, lamenting that in just one generation, Nagaland had changed. This was the end result of seeds planted 90 years earlier by a man who decided to be a missionary. Edwin Clark and his wife traveled from Boston to India as missionaries in 1868. And now this is 1868. And in the 1960s, Fuhrer Heimendorf was saying, oh, man, everything's changed. What might happen in Samoa? Well, Samoa's got a lot of Christianity already, but I was thinking about uh, Linda's mom and dad, the seeds that they planted of faith, and how that echoes in eternity, the things we do for Christ change eternity. Uh, they traveled from Boston to India as missionaries in 1868. When they got to India, he was working among uh, predominantly Hindu peoples, but he, he knew about these horrible headhunters. He said, just over the mountains, there are untold numbers of people who don't know the love of God. And it broke his heart. And his man, he and his wife, had a passion and desire to go tell the headhunters about Jesus Christ. At first, the British government would not permit him into Nagaland. And so he... <coughs> Providentially, he met a, a Naga tribesman, baptized him, and he went back and was a bridge that reached the, the gospel. But if you know anything about the history of, a history of missions, the British government, people have an idea that England went everywhere and they're pushing Christianity and Western culture, and that is so far from the truth. The British government, well, especially the, the East Indian Tea Company, they would go and they wanted control lands to make money. They often would throw Christian missionaries in jail. The British government wanted two things. They wanted money, and they wanted uh, uh, safety. They wanted stability within the lands. And they saw missionaries as a danger to both because people, the Naga people got angry. The more people became Christians, the more the Nagas got riled up because their culture was changing. So the British government was actually often an enemy to missionaries. Uh, However, after a few years, nine Nagas were baptized in 1872. So 1872, you had nine Nagas baptized. They planted the first church in Nagaland the same year on December 22nd, 18... 
1872, I believe, and 28 members celebrated their first communion as a church. So I thought that was neat. We're celebrating communion today. Back in 1872, 28 headhunters, headhunters, were celebrating the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, just like we do in their brand new church. So I want to ask you, what could God do with 28 former headhunters? Well, God can't do anything with 20. Oh, come off it. Well, what could God do with a handful of, uh, with 12 disciples who would betray him? One would betray him. They'd all be scattered. One would deny him. He can do anything. In 1905, Clark saw, so 1905, from 1868, now it's 1905, Clark is still there. He saw his best year ever, 190 baptisms in one year. That's impressive. That must have been an exciting year, but still, so many unchurched people all around. Just a, during his lifetime, just a small fraction of 1% of that nation became believers. I wonder if he ever felt hopeless. Then Nagaland was cut off from the West and Western missionaries for a number of years, decades. Christianity didn't begin to grow quickly until long after Clark was gone laboring for fruit he didn't get to see all of it in the 1950s and 1960s nagaland experienced two great revivals in the 1960s is called nagaland's great awakening by the 1980s nagaland was 32 percent christian isn't that amazing from nothing from headhunters to 32 percent christian in the 1980s today according to the official census of the government of india that number is over 90%, making Nagaland the most Christian state on the planet. God, you see a bunch of headhunters and people taking heads and preserving them in huts filled with heads and people who for centuries have been killing one another and say, that's hopeless, I'm not going to go there. And God says, I'm going to take them. They're going to be mine. And today, the Naga people are some of the greatest missionaries. The way the Koreans are going out everywhere telling Jesus, the Naga people are evangelizing Tibet in India. In, in two of the states around them, there's three states in India now that are majority Christian. Nagaland and two states around them. Don't tell God what he can't do. What could God do with 28 former headhunters? What could God do with... 12 weak fishermen and people that were looked down at by society. This was accomplished, the salvation, the reaching of Nagaland was accomplished the way the Greeks were reached, not by the sword, but the love of God. The way the Vikings were, the Vikings were never defeated militarily by Christians. The Vikings were converted when they saw the love of Jesus and people coming to them again and again and again with the faith of Jesus Christ. The Polynesians, fierce warriors today, Polynesia is another, uh, the Polynesian people spread out over the islands are some of the most Christianized groups in the world. The Koreans, the Chinese, again and again, miracle after miracle after miracle. And we sit around in the West and say, it's a Western religion. Meanwhile, Koreans are going everywhere telling people about Jesus. Not with weapons, with love. Look what God can do with just a handful of people that were gathered around this Last Supper with just a few headhunters. And I want you to look around this room. What are, we, what are we looking around at? Yeah. Room full of sinners saved by grace. What can God do with this room? If we're committed to going over to the next village over, even though some people are going to laugh at us and think they pulled the wool over our eyes when they're missing the plot, God is doing great things. Don't miss the plot. We're, we're seeing the life of Christ. It's gaining speed. He's going right up to the cross where he died for my sins, your sins. I am forgiven. I'm set free. I'm going to heaven, not because I'm good, but because he's good. And I'll tell you what, don't you want to just grab everybody you can? Grab everybody you can, and let's bring, them, let's bring them into the family. Let's go together. And let's see what God can do with a room full of people who are willing to surrender their lives to him. Amen.
Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area, and I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to 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 know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So, uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Hi, this is John with Foundation TV. You know, Foundation Church is a small church uh, here in Janesville. We do a lot with the size of the congregation that we have. Uh, and we've been really pleased to host Foundation TV for many years. Uh, however, due to budget constraints, we're no longer able to do that at this time. Uh, if you would like to find Foundation TV, we're still available on YouTube uh, at the address below and on local access channels 98 and in HD 994. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.